good morning uh, good afternoon good evening everybody uh, welcome to this webinar uh, on the role of uh, social enterprises in advancing the sustainable development goal my name is yogesh ghore i am a senior program staff uh, at the godi international institute at san francis xavier university uh, in antigonish nova scotia canada and i welcome you all uh, to this uh, uh, to this webinar uh let me first uh, begin uh, by uh, acknowledging uh, that uh, uh, that san francis xavier university where where i am sitting right now is situated in mi'kmaq the unceded territory uh, of the mi'kmaq people uh, i also realize uh, that we are uh, joining in from uh, various different lands and and we acknowledge uh, the traditional caretakers and owners of those lands as well uh let me first uh, uh, call on uh, we are organizing this uh, this webinar in collaboration with the the atlantic council for international cooperation acic and and uh, we have a colleague uh, janelle from there uh, so i would welcome her first uh, to uh, talk about the international development week that we are observing uh, um, uh, this week uh, and the focus of this year's uh, uh, <clears throat> the theme of this year's <clears throat> international development week so janelle over to you Thank you, Yogesh. Thanks everyone for having me. It's great to be here today. And uh, um, ACIC is very happy to, to have uh, Cody International Institute as a member. Um, so I'll just speak very briefly about ACIC and then about International Development Week. Um, and I also wanna mention that I too uh, am in the land of Mi'kmaq uh, and which is also known as Nova Scotia. So the Atlantic Council for International Cooperation, also known as ACIC, is a coalition of individuals, organizations, and institutions working in the Atlantic region to build and model just, equitable, and sustainable communities, both locally and globally. ACIC connects leadership across generations by strengthening members and partners, uh, bridging dialogue and building networking and learning opportunities. And ACIC also represents and amplifies the voice of Atlantic Canada and connects uh, the Atlantic with other provincial, national and international stakeholders. Uh, so I uh, am also here because it's International Development Week. And I'm uh, very happy that Cody is uh, hosting this event during this week, also known as IDW. And it's an annual in initiative that's held during the first full week of February. And it started back in 1991 to engage Canadians on global issues and engaging other people too. So IDW brings together Canadians from coast to coast to coast and highlights the role that Canadians play in building better, more equitable, just and sustainable communities. Uh, and, and the work that is happening by all of you all over the world. And this year we have a, a range of engagement opportunities including Facebook live concerts, musical events, arts contests, panel discussions such as the one you're participating in today, uh, po poetry competitions, online trivia and blogs. And I'll put a link in the chat uh, that links uh, to all the events that ACIC is, is either promoting or help, helping to host. Um, and you can participate and learn more about why the sustainable development goals are important uh, by following hashtag IDW Atlantic and hashtag go for the goals. And that's on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn. Um, so there's lots of events happening and most of them are virtual. Uh, so feel free to check out our website to see them all there. And uh, I will finish there. And once again, say thanks for having me. Um, I have to be one of the tech people support for another IDW event. So I will have to leave in about uh, 10 minutes myself to, to go to set that up. But uh, once again, thank you so much for having me and I hope you have a uh, great event. Thank you, thank you, Janelle. And I think uh, uh, the silver lining of this this pandemic is that now we can we can connect with colleagues uh, all all ac across the world. So when we talk about uh, Canada's role and Canada's contribution to to global development, international development, uh, like what we have today, you know, uh, 249 uh, people registered from all across uh, all across the world, and I see. Uh, uh, close to 70 people are already there in the in the in the zoom call right now so uh, with this we have the opportunity to actually not only talk about among canadians uh, the contributions we have made uh, for for international development but get those voices in the uh, in, in in the meeting 
so now uh, let me um, first of all I'm very very excited to see the level uh, level of engagement uh, for this uh, for this webinar this shows that the, the topic is of of, of interest uh, now let me call uh, uh, my co-host and and uh, facilitator of the courses that I uh, teach here at the Cody Institute including the the course that uh, um, that him and I developed uh, um, on on social uh, enterprises, uh, Farooq Jiva. Um, he Farooq and I have been working for the last uh, 15 years, uh, including uh, 10, 11 years at, at Cody. Uh, he's a social entrepreneur uh, himself. Uh, so I'll, I'll let uh, Farooq speak a little bit about himself and 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 the and the course uh, uh, that we teach uh, and uh, about the participants uh, and and some of them you will meet uh, later later uh, during this meeting. So Farooq. Well, thank you, Yogesh. I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm going to say very much about myself, but what I what I would like to just take a moment to do is, uh, uh, you know, I think first and foremost uh, acknowledge the incredible work that the Cody Institute has been doing in so many different areas of the of the kind of work that we do, the incredible range of international partnerships we have. I'm looking through the through the list of people attending, and there's so many different alumni, past course participants here as well. So it's wonderful to see that. Uh, as Yogesh mentioned, we've been working together for the last 15 odd years together now. And we've developed a, a whole suite of courses that the Cody Institute are, are offering. We try and make sure that we create courses that have a really strong balance between the sort of practitioner driven perspective, uh, along with the sort of theory that underpins a lot of the work that needs to happen. And we try to make sure that it's really relevant for people from around the world. One of the big focus for us over the last little while is making sure that it's equally relevant for Canadians in Atlantic Canada, across the country, uh, as well as participants attending globally. And the social enterprise course that will be kicking off from the first week of March is no exception. It's going to be the second time that we are teaching this course and we designed it from the very beginning to be both local and global. Uh, this course is going to be online uh, so unlike the other ones that we've had to do where we've had the opportunity to uh, welcome everyone to Antigonish, uh, we see this uh, obviously as a, as, a, as a disappointment because Antigonish and, and Nova Scotia is a beautiful part of the world to host people in. Uh, but I think the, the online platform is going to give us the opportunity to widen the conversation, have more practitioners joining us from different parts of the world, and hopefully have more participants uh, attending the course as well. We've structured the social enterprise course so that it runs over a course of seven weeks. And uh, what we're hoping to do is uh, make sure that we can really create value for our participants from whatever part of the world they are in and whatever stage of the social enterprise journey they may be on. Having uh, established two social enterprises myself over the last little while, having been involved in incubating so many of them through my work in, in different places, uh, it's definitely a fascinating area that we want to unpack and explore with you and the seven week online course will help us to be able to do this. But for today, we, we have uh, you know, the, the privilege of uh, inviting three of our alumni back to have a conversation with us. Uh, Magali uh, has been doing some incredible work in Haiti and she was one of the alumni from our social enterprise course in 2019. And Pauline, whom you'll hear uh, um, from as well, is doing some incredible work in, in Nova Scotia. And uh, last but not least is Fati, who uh, attended one of our Livelihoods and Markets courses, which actually created the inspiration for us to, to create the social enterprise course as a separate offering. And I think also inspired um, Fati to go off and do what she's done, done uh, in, in, uh, in West Africa. We have the opportunity to, to hear their stories. And what I would love to do is you know, spend as much time as possible delving into their own journeys, understanding a little bit more about some of the things that they've come across and uh, some advice and tips they might have to share. Um, Yogesh, if you want to navigate that conversation, we can jump in along the way. Yes, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Farooq, for, uh, for, for providing that, that, that context of uh, uh, local and, and global. And that's what I think through these webinars we'll, we'll try to showcase as well. Let me first uh, introduce our, um, uh, our panelists. Uh, and, and Farooq and I are very proud to say that they are graduates of, of the courses that we have taught over the years. Uh, <clears throat> let me start with the, with the farthest. So let me introduce uh, Fati uh, Abigail Abdullahi. Uh, she is the executive director of Widows and Orphans Movement. Uh, and she's the national director. It's a, it's a reputable non-governmental organization uh, founded uh, by her mother in, in 1993. And, and she, she took over uh, in, in 2013. 
and and her her role is she starts to advocate for the rights of widows and economically uh, uh, to economically empower a woman and young people uh, she's a dynamic leader uh, passionate about uh, bringing change uh, in in uh, in her community and and country uh, she came here in 2013, and I, I remember after taking the, the livelihoods and markets course that Farooq and I uh, facilitated, she said that, you know, a lot of what you ta uh, taught us in terms of the value chain, in terms of the markets, in terms of social enterprise, a lot of this we already do, but we never call it that way. We never call what we do as, as a social enterprise. So you have provided us this, this framework, and now I'm going to go and, and really do it in a, in a structured way. And that's what she has, she has done. So we will hear her, her her story, how she has she has created this enterprise that sells the products of those women internationally, and she just got uh, uh, in, an investment of, of a million uh, CDs, Ghanaian CDs, that we would like to hear how she started with a nonprofit and built this successful enterprise. Uh, is Magali here? Magali, have you joined us? Yes. Okay, welcome, Magali. Again, a great uh, privilege for, for me to introduce Magali. Uh, she is the president and CEO of Caribbean uh, Craft. And as Farooq said, she attended our course uh, in 20, uh, 2019. Uh, she is a real advocate for change uh, in the current business structures in Haiti. She believes uh, in creation of social enterprises is the only way to reduce social gap and, and, and create opportunities for the uh, unemployed citizens of, of Haiti. Maggie has spent uh, over 20 years uh, working with, uh, with the artisan uh, sector and, and partnering with the uh, NGO and the, uh, and the state to build uh, what she calls as, 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 as brand Haiti. She's a successful uh, uh, entrepreneur uh, and, and, uh, and, and her, uh, her infectious enthusiasm, uh, sharp sense of opportunity, ability to build relationships across the sector, and, and geographies and, and makes her a very well-known face in uh, in Haiti. So I'm uh, so hope or we hope to hear during this this one hour that we we, we learn to we learn some of those uh, some of those uh, lessons and, and 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 best practices. And last but not the least, uh, I have a great uh, privilege and 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 pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague uh, Pauline McIntosh. Uh, her and I have been uh, together. We we have the, we have our offices the same floor uh, for the last eleven years, but she's been with the with the Centfax uh, Extension Department for the last uh, close to twenty five years. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Pauline. And she is uh, she provides leadership to uh, the department's uh, rural leadership program, and and works with a network of community based uh, organizations, uh, including the one that she's going to uh, talk about uh, in today's presentation, and that is the Antigonish Affordable Housing Society uh, and the innovative work uh, she's doing. So we have these three uh, uh, speakers. Uh, one common connection uh, um, um, between them is that they are all uh, graduates of the, of, the, uh, of the Cody Institute and, and the certificates that, uh, that we have taught. But another one is, is that, you know, uh, the, the key aspects uh, and, 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 and the, the focus of today's talk is around how uh, the social enterprises uh, contribute to uh, sustainable development goals. And as we know, there are 17 goals, 169 targets. It can be very overwhelming when you look at it, it uh, uh, from, a, from a global scale. So what we are going to do today is, is, is not to talk about from, from that high level, but to see how these goals uh, uh, are localized, how you can look at these problems locally and what these entrepreneurs, these, uh, uh, these organizations are trying to do, uh, how they are, what they are doing and, uh, and, and how they are doing it. So with that, let me first, and the other thing we are not going to do, we are not going to just like focus on defining what a social enterprise is. I think that is only incidental. What is important is, is, is what they are doing, how they are innovating, how they are getting the investments, how they are creating the impact, how they are building the partnership. That aspect is, is more important rather than fitting a, uh, your enterprise in a nice, uh, nice definition. So with that, let me call again, let me go the farthest uh, because we might have some challenges in terms of internet connectivity. So Fati, just tell us about your story in, in, in five to seven minutes. Yeah, hello, Yogesh, and thanks um, for this opportunity. Hello to everybody. Um, 
So basically, I'm Fati, and I run a social enterprise called Atara Ghana Limited. And this is to say it's a for-profit um, entity. Um, and we officially started, I think, 2013, when I came back from Cody. Um, that was when we actually restructured it. And what Atara Ghana Limited does basically is to focus on identifying, developing, and promoting indigenous value chains that are dominated by women. So if, if it's indigenous to us and we don't find a lot of women in that um, sector, we don't really go into it. And so currently some of the value chains we are working on is the baobab value chain, the share value chain, and we have the basketry among others. And so for us, we look at how do we ensure that we are making money as a business, but also we are putting money in the hands of the women we are working with. So first of all, economically, we should, we should, we should make money. Secondly, we look at the environmental sustainability issues. So most of the value chains that we choose to work on should be contributing to environmental sustainability. And also the processes we use in terms of developing these value chains also be sustainable practices. So for instance, if we work on um, Baobab or Shea, these are um, value chains that we believe that by earning money from it, the child element of what we do, which is actually very dear to us, has to do with working with widows and orphans. And so as a social enterprise, we source all our raw materials from mostly widows and orphans. And we listen to them, how do they think we can make this actually work for them and for the business going forward. And so we work with widows because of our peculiar situation here. And it might be a global situation as well for most widows. Um, internationally and both locally, we know that when women lose their husbands, um, in some cultures, they are regarded as witches. Um, people think that they are ill luck women. And so that is why they have caused the death of their husbands. And so society makes them go through some rites and practices that actually make them worse off. And so in where we are located, which is Upper East and in Ghana for that matter, you would find that many of these women will lose the properties that they had um, when they were married or when their houses were alive in the name of rights and practices or culture. And some of them are actually um, stripped naked um, to the full glare of the public, which makes them um, self-isolate and do not want to mingle with people. And so as a business, we believe that if these women are able to earn an income, then they do have a voice and they can renegotiate some of these um, rights or practices meted out to them, but equally they can resist them because they are financially able to do so. And from the work we have done as an NGO through Widows and Orphans Movement, we've realized that in most instances, when these women are economically empowered, they are better able to resist most of these um, um, practices that are meted out to them. And so holistically, this is how Atara Ghana um, operates. We have the social value, we look at the economic, and we also look at the environmental. Um, Yogesh, I don't know if you would want me to just go straight into some of the SDGs we are targeting. Uh, you quickly just talk about which ones and then more questions we'll, we'll ask later, yeah. Yes. Yes. So basically we work on the, um, we focus more on three of the SDGs. One is no poverty in all its forms. Two is achieving gender equality and empowering all women and girls. And the third one is to reduce inequality within and among um, countries. And so through this social enterprise, we, we, our statistics tell us that if we are able to provide this income we provide for the women all year round, most of them will automatically migrate from the extreme poverty gap to 
um, poor or even exceed and not be poor again. And so this is how we are doing it. Also, um, we focus on women. So we believe in women economic empowerment. So SDG five and one, no poverty because once people are not poor, they are able to make better decisions. They are able to demand for their rights. So in a nutshell, this is what we do. Thank you, Fatih. And then I had the uh, opportunity to visit Fatih many times uh, as she was going through this uh, journey. And what would be really interesting, Fatih, for you to share later on, what women value in terms of their, their empowerment, the, the, the changes you see uh, in them as they get this, this, uh, this access to opportunity and access to sustainable income. So hold on for that. Let me go to uh, yeah. Magali. Magali. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me here with you all today. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, I have. Um, I really admire yes, the work that you do, Fadi. This is amazing. Uh, you, you inspire me. So, uh, you know, you know, just, just to talk a little about, about the company that I have um, started already 16 years ago. I feel old. Uh, all this started because there's a big gap in Haiti, and uh, growing up. It was like I was programmed to know that it was normal to to evolve in isolated groups, and knowing that um, you were born in a in a in a in a in a place and you could die in that place, regardless of your education and opportunity and zero opportunity was given to anyone. So this became a very big concern as I was growing up because I thought it was unacceptable. I I I was trying to understand why is it that nobody would have the chance to emerge, even if they were willing to work or willing to learn. So um, we started working, I mean, I have to say that my husband started this um, a long time before I got in, involved um, in this company where we started training um, the artisan and the artists to, to become able to produce items that could be fit, suitable for the international market. Um, when I joined this team about 20 years ago, um, the concern became, but how do we really have an impact if it's only focused on profit, we will not help address the real issues. And the real issues in Haiti, we all know about them. It's about the lack of opportunity. People are stuck in misery and held hostage by political turmoil. So what we have decided to do is show a new model of how we can do business in a profitable way, but addressing real issues and giving people real opportunities to go up the ladder. And this is, I have to say in 2019, I had the opportunity to be at Cody and this really made a pivot into my way of doing business completely. We did have the essence of it. We did do business, just like you said, buddy. We've always been doing it, but having the right terms and addressing the right people in the right network made a, diff made, made a whole world of difference. I did not understand the language of donors. I did not understand that I was eligible to have some assistance because I did not, I only saw myself as a business, but I didn't see how important and how impactful the work that I was doing, um, it, how impactful it was. So at attending that, that social entrepreneurship class really helped me gather the tool that I needed to speak their language, to, have, to help raise the voice of the others who are silent and got me more, even more passionate about the work that I do and see how further we can take it. So for, for the moment, we are reshifting our way of doing business by creating that, that future hub that will be a place where any small social entrepreneur can have the tools the knowledge and the, and the structure needed for them to flourish, not for them to be struggling and go all to the burdens that I went through, but for them to have the, the backup and the, and the team behind to make them successful. So we really focus on, um, I would say five, but a lot of them, but five are the most important for us, decent work, as we know that the work conditions in countries like mine sometimes are terrible. And we, the fact that we're working with very um, engaged partners from across the world, we, we have to um, rethink and reorganize our space so it's as, as efficient, but as comfortable for all of our artisans. Reduce inequality uh, is one thing that we focus on. And as Fadi said, no poverty. It's not normal that we have such a high rate of poverty here in Haiti and gender equality. In gender equality, I'd like to spend one minute, I know that I've been talking a lot, but uh, to share a story with you. I remember um, we were in a phase where we had not gotten enough orders and we were about to lay off a lot of our artisans. And uh, one of them came to me and he said, Madame Dress, please give me a chance to stay on the boat on the team. And I said, yes, I'm trying my best, but I just need to have the market. And she looked at me and she said, that's the only way they respect me. They respect me because I have a job. My husband beat, used to beat me, but now he respects me because I earn my living. 
And these are the kind of things that make you realize that there's so much work to be done in terms of giving these women a voice, giving them uh, the, the framework where they could be respected, where they could be taken in um, as, a, as equally as a man. Um, we are in a very magic society here where women, even the most educated one, still tend to believe that they still have to be behind a successful man to, to have a voice. And these are the kind of things that, that a social enterprise could help shift. We need to find ways to, to fill two things, the gap between the, the, the fortunate of our society and the less fortunate, and only with social enterprises we could do that, and also build stronger women because I strongly believe that if Haiti was put in the hands of, of, of its women, we would not have been in the situation that we are in today. So this is what I do. I, I focus on um, developing with the groups of artisans across Haiti, to, um, successful collections that are for the international market, giving them a voice through our channel, through our website, through our advertising campaigns to our, to our work basically, and trying to see how we could reduce poverty and rebrand Haiti. Thank you. Thank you, Magali. It's, it's amazing uh, when we talk about the, uh, the sustainable development goal and, uh, and uh, this, this emerging uh, or developing economies and the kind of challenges uh, that are there, socioeconomic, political, uh, natural. And uh, within those, how do you actually navigate and, and create enterprises uh, which don't provide uh, handouts, but, but create real opportunities for people. So I'm sure there'll be questions that, that we'll get back to. Okay, uh, last but not the least, uh, Pauline, close to home. Uh, uh, it would be great if you, if you talk about the, the, the housing work that you're doing here. Thanks so much, Yagesh, and it's, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here with you folks today. And I'm, I'm honored to sit on a panel with Magali and Fati. And, and to have this opportunity to interact with you and Farouk once again. So thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I'm here today to speak about the work of the Antigonish Affordable Housing Society. And in that organization, I'm a member of the board. And the Antigonish Affordable Housing Society is essentially a nonprofit organization that exists to provide housing for people who are living on low income in the Antigonish community. And before I talk specifically about the work of the organization, I just want to frame it in, in a broader context of the issues around homelessness and housing that are worldwide. And the latest numbers that I saw, which are of course pre-pandemic, uh, indicated that 1.6 billion people live or have inadequate housing globally. And Statistics Canada, their latest numbers in 2016 indicated that almost 1.7 million people were lacking core housing or they were in core housing need in this country. And to bring it down to Nova Scotia, in 2016, we learned that 13% of Nova Scotian households are living with core housing need. So this is an issue, not just locally, but also one that impacts uh, the world in a, in a very significant way. Um, in 2017, the federal government of Canada announced a national housing strategy. So this was a, is a 10 year plan to hopefully address homelessness and housing precarity in the country and to support um, addressing this problem as a nation, as a country. And the work that we do at Antigonish Affordable Housing is just part of that overall initiative. And the UN SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals and the Agenda 2030, as we all know, are about leaving no one behind. And there are four goals in particular that we feel the work of our organization addresses specifically. The first is no poverty. The third of the, of the goals is good health and well-being. The seventh goal is affordable and clean energy. And the 11th is sustainable cities and communities. And we feel that our work aligns really well with those goals. So as I said, we're a volunteer organization. Uh, we've been around for quite some time, but it has taken us a lot of time and energy in the last number of years to really solidify the board itself, the organization, so that we're able to do the work. And I have to say that taking the course with you and Farouk really helped me think differently about the work that we're doing and how, like, like Magali and Fatih both articulated, how to think about our work and perhaps frame it differently when talking with folks 
whether they're funders or the community or whomever. Uh, but the work that we do allows us to work with local government, provincial government, uh, other organizations who are supportive of our vision, and I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, but in 2017, we began with the construction of four homes. In 2018, we also built an additional 10 in the local area and a community room. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But in 2021, this year, we're also planning to build another 12 homes with an additional community room for those folks. So the fundamental belief of our organization is that all people have a right to safe, secure, and affordable housing. That is the premise upon which we do all of our work. And we will collaborate with others to ensure that people living on low income in Antigonish have appropriate, and affordable, socially supported housing. That's our raison d'etre, that's why we exist. And to do our work, we frame it in three pillars. And the first is social sustainability, the second is environmental sustainability, and the third is financial sustainability. So all the work that we do, we look at it through the lens of sustainability from those three perspectives. We sometimes think of it as a three-legged stool and each leg of that stool has to be just as strong as the other in order for the stool to remain upright and solid. We also see some of our work as being quite innovative Innovative in the sense that we're addressing a gap in the market. So there's an absolute need for affordable housing. We're also addressing the inadequate provision of affordable housing and appropriate, ho appropriate housing for people who live on low income. One of the things that we, we feel uh, differentiate, differentiates us from housing uh, in the past is we provide high quality homes and we have access to social supports for people who, who live with us in our development. We have an ability to leverage individual community, public and private support toward a common goal. It's been absolutely incredible how much support we've had from our local community uh, in support of these developments. In terms of investment in this work, because it, it, it takes a lot of money to support this kind of de development, uh, we've been able to access grants. We've had private and public donations. We have loans, so mortgages on our buildings, the same as, as anyone else building a home probably. And we've been able to access uh, part of the funding available through the National Housing Strategy called a co-investment fund. That's one that we are using in order to, to do our construction this year, building those 12 new units with, with a community room. And we also generate uh, revenue annually through, through our rents, through the rent that we collect. Uh, we have a mix of grant donor and investment capital as well as revenue generation. Um, we also started small. So we built four, four homes to begin with. So then that enabled us to have a bit of proof of product. Uh, we were able to show people that we were able to do the work successfully that we set out to do. We had a bit of a track record and this made us much more attractive from other funders and, and sources of financing that helped us get across the threshold and move to, uh, to scale our work a bit. And we also feel that having a common vision with, um, with people who support our work really helps incentivize it. So working with organizations and groups that share our values and share our vision for providing affordable housing to people who live on low income helps us do our work more effectively and with greater impact. Another part of our work, and I'll, I'll end here, is that we also feel as an organization that is part of our responsibility, uh, not just to do our work locally, but also to support broader initiatives province-wide and even nationally uh, to illuminate the discussion around affordable housing and to look at solutions and innovative ways to approach housing precarity and homelessness and to share what we're learning and to hopefully help groups in other communities um, expedite the work that they're trying to do to meet these really important issues. And there are lots of examples that I could share in terms of our, our social sustainability as well as our environmental and financial, but I can stop there, Yogesh, if that's appropriate and we'll, maybe those things will come out in the questions. Yes, yeah. 
thank you thank you pauline and it's it's nice that you uh, you talked about sustainability from the point of view of social uh, financial and environmental because if you look at all the all the 16 goals you can divide them into those those three yes. three pillars that's how they were they were conceptualized and then there was the goal of the partnerships uh, so yeah I'm, I'm sure there'll be there'll be questions we'll we'll get back to you with, with more insights um, Pauline, uh, I, I see there are some, some questions coming in already. Uh, <clears throat> so let me first uh, begin uh, uh, with, with you, Fatih. <clears throat> I know uh, uh, you started, uh, uh, you became the executive director of uh, uh, Women's uh, uh, Widows and Orphans Movement, and you continue to, uh, to do that work. Uh, and, and it's very important work of, of working with widows, uh, about their rehabilitation, about providing uh, that, that security, very, very important work of creating that, uh, that social support for that particular group. Amazing work your NGO does. Now, what motivated you to start a for-profit company? Uh, because you were already had grants and, and, and you were, the, the, the main work was to support those women. But what motivated you to create this structure and uh, how it happened? So there's some, some questions around that. And uh, yeah, first start with that, and then there, there are more questions. Yeah, okay, so thank you very much. So, maybe Fatih, switch off your uh, video. I think uh, the NGO bits, um, but if, is it much better? Yeah, maybe maybe switch off your video and then that might help. Okay, let's see. Hello. Yeah, is you're, it you're better, better now? Yeah, yeah, better now, Fatih. Okay. So um basically from the work we've been doing, we realized that when we work for some aspects, so Yogesh, are you hearing me? Yeah. Yes. So, um, yes, the NGO bit would train people on new skills. Um, they would go further to give them startup capital. But then we realized that there was option that was not um, as an NGO, it, it became quite difficult to assess markets um, based on the already standing work we had to do. Apart from that, in our case, we realized that most of our women feel more dignified when they work for the money. So, you know, charity is more like people are giving you, people, people think that, oh, you need help. And so they are giving you, and it is not out of place. There are some people that would always need that bit. But then most people, after they have gone through that level, actually feel dignified when they work for their money. And so we are also providing people that sense of dignity to feel dignified, to ensure that, okay, yes, um, I can work for my money and I feel more human when I work for my money than when um, I'm just relying on charity all the time. But then again, as an organization, even um, for a charity, which is Widows and Orphans Movement, we realize that for our own sustainability, it's not always that we can go begging for money. And there are some things that as an NGO, you would need to do that some donors would not really allow you to do. So most donor funding comes with some strings attached. You can use this money for this, you can use this money for that. But then if you've done NGO work, you realize that actually sometimes what donor money tells you you can't use the money for is actually what needs to be done to help people. And so we opted for a for-profit structure because we equally wanted money that could allow us to do the things that we realized that need to be done, but which other donors are not willing to fund us do. And so um, a lot of reasons went into choosing the structure for a for-profit um, 
organizational entity. And and you'll remember, Fati, the the initial uh, uh, grant that you got uh, to to set up another uh, machine for processing baobab oil that came from uh, yes. Comart Foundation. David Martin, actually, he's he's there in the audience, and he has a very specific oh, question. Nice. Yes, he's there, uh, and he has a very specific. Hello, David. I don't think he can, he can speak because he's not he doesn't have the privilege. But he has a question okay. that I'm going to ask you. Okay. Uh, Hi, so Okay. So, uh, hey, David, you, you can speak, so you can ask the question directly. Well, you've got a yeah, Fatty, you've got a for-profit uh, organization. The Ghanaian government apparently has invested in it. Uh, in what manner did they invest? As a shareholder, it was it an equity investment? Debt or and what do they expect to get out of it? Dividends or, or what? Okay. Thanks, David. And and I would like to use this opportunity actually to thank um, David Martin and the Comart Foundation so much um, for supporting Atara to get this far. Um, I think without their support, we wouldn't have been able to get this far. Not only did they give us grants, but they also uh, Um, supported um, yoga provide technology we will always remain great thing the the current investment um, we are getting is actually not from the Ghana government so this is a group of impact investors that obviously um, invest in businesses based on profit but also they are looking um, for social good and so um, part of the investment, is to also be um, shareholders in the business. But then um, part of the investment is actually um, in a form of a loan form where we will pay back um, over the next six years um, going forward. Um, does that answer the question? David? Yeah, I have trouble with the odd beauty, but that, yes, it does, Fatty. Yeah, this is wonderful. I mean, this is, uh, wow, <laughs> unbelievable. Well done. Yeah. It is, It is, David. And and I remember uh, uh, Fatty got, uh, uh, her connection is, is, is not good. When you had actually made that initial investment and the kind of uh, challenges she had to go through to get the machinery, get the engineer from Accra, having no power, from that stage to have an uh, impact investor, those guys don't invest unless you have a solid model, uh, business model. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge progress. So yeah, great job done on that. Uh, I have more questions coming in uh, for uh, both for Pauline and, and Magali as well. Uh, so let me uh, let me begin with, with Magali. Magali, you mentioned uh, uh, the, the language of, of donors. And uh, in your uh, uh, in your initial remarks, you also talked about um, working uh, with with NGOs and and working with the with the state as as a as a private business. So can you can you just uh, speak a little bit uh, about? So you 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 always remain a, a private enterprise, uh, uh, providing employment opportunities uh, to uh, to mostly underserved uh, communities. Uh, how do you actually create partnerships with the NGOs and with the state? And then how do you create that sector level impact? impact? So it's just not your enterprises that creates employment. You have, you, you're changing the sector. Uh, thank you for the question. This is, um, I, I'd like to say something. Fadi started with the NGO, then has her business. We started with the business. Now we have an NGO branch because the work that we're doing for the nature of it, there's no way we could go further if we don't have that branch, that NGO partner. Um, first of all, it, with as a for business, a for profit only, uh, we are would not be eligible to establish partnership with other foundations for us to carry on our education programs or feeding programs. And these are kind of things that are dear to our vision, but that we can't support into our pricing that will make us non-competitive. So having, after all this experience being only a for-profit, 
I was struggling to keep go keep keep going with with these programs that are very important to us. Our success is not how much money we can make; is how much we could change the life of the artisans. So um, having that nonprofit arm is opening us new doors, and uh, and all of this was we decided to do after 2019 because I did not know how this world, I couldn't understand how this world functioned. How, it was complicated to me, the impact investor, the angel investors, all of this sounded like Chinese until I went to, um, to Antigone and said, this is pretty clear. And you are doing the work that they're looking for and how can we connect the gap, the dots? Um, so working with the government here in Haiti is something that we have not been yet successful, but we are looking beyond that and working with communities and organizations who have that who share our vision. Um, so we have uh, we have started building a new website where artisan and artisan groups will be able to brand their items and share them with the world. We believe that the market size is so big that we have a responsibility to share what we learned with the rest of the groups so they can speed up their development. So that is why um, having that NGO arm now with the private uh, for-profit company enables us to tackle, tackle deep into the market with our, with our marketing strategy, but also carry on with our social impact programs such as education, fee, feeding, financing, um, and, and, and so on, all the things that we believe that we have the responsibility to address if we want to be um, helping the artisan sector as a whole go forward and not keep them in a disguised misery. Yes, uh, thank you, Magali. Uh, it's really interesting. So uh, when we talk about uh, social enterprises, is uh, both the examples of, of you and Fatih tell that it's a uh, it's hybrid organizations so you have a mix of for profit and non profit working simultaneously in mm -hmm. case of pati she started non profit and she has a for profit arm in your case you are at the non profit now and and both have to uh, run simultaneously to create the social and, and economic value uh, pauline um, there is a question for you as well uh, you talked about uh, a proof of concept, creating a, a proof of concept and, and starting small uh, mm -hmm. and then building on. So can you just please expand why, why, that, is, uh, why that is necessary? And also maybe on this question of uh, for-profit, non-for-profit, you are also as a, as, a, as a board, as an organization, straight, like looking at this, right? Sure, uh, thanks, Yogesh. So yes, we certainly identify as a non-profit and the reason that we do is because that enables us to have charitable status in the province of Nova Scotia. And with charitable status, we are able to, to fundraise and to, to receive money from people who want to support our mission. And that wouldn't be the case if we were organized officially as a, as a for-profit enterprise. So for us, there are advantages in that regard, uh, but we're definitely a social purpose organization. Oh, you know, we, we are an enterprise and we do run a business in terms of, of uh, you know, our product is affordable housing, affordable homes for which people pay rent. So we are generating revenue to cover our costs in part, but we're definitely a nonprofit and a social purpose organization. In terms of the build of the first four units, um, you know, I have to say that this organization, organization existed for many, many, many years. And, you know, for a variety of reasons, it was never able to pull the trigger. And by that, I mean, it was very difficult to get to the point where we could actually begin building, begin creating the homes. And even though we had fundraised and even though we had generated some, some capital to invest in the, in the construction of the, the first homes, we had planned to build 14 at the beginning. We could not generate enough capital to do that. And we didn't have any experience behind us. We couldn't say to the investors, we know we can do this because we've done it before. And we were very, very fortunate to have the support of a private donor. And that private donor was the congregation of the Sisters of St. Martha, who had faith in us, who believed in our mission and were willing to take a chance and provide some, some financing that enabled us to build those first four units. And with that experience under our belts and with that, that proof of product and proof of success, that, became, that made us much more bankable or financeable in terms of going to other investors. 
So that was a really critical point in our evolution as an organization in terms of being able to prove what we were able to do and then to scale that, that first construction of four homes, which is very, very small. Uh, but it enabled us to scale that and to, to leverage that asset and to build on our experience to do more. Mm -hmm. And, and one thing I think, uh, Pauline, you talked about creating safe, secure, and affordable uh, spaces. But uh, w when we took our class to see, uh, to see the affordable housing project uh, in 2019, one feedback I got that these houses uh, are affordable, are safe, but they, they, by no means they are low in quality. This is how oh, yeah. anybody can, can live in. So that also tells you that people with low income should have access to the same kind of housing that mm -hmm. anybody else can live. And that was, I think, uh, kind of a big uh, um, uh, aha moment for all the participants that said, look, no, mm -hmm. when, when somebody has a, a, an, an affordable house like that, they can, they can be better at work as well. They, they can mm -hmm. have more opportunities opened up. Uh, and also uh, it's, it's good you, you, you point out, and this is what we learned in the class as well, that you, you, you always start with a, with, a, with a proof of concept, uh, a, a strong prototype, Mm -hmm. do a piloting of that and then go to scale. So that mm -hmm. sequence is, is, is really, really um, key. Mm -hmm. The more questions coming in, uh, is one uh, more for you, uh, Fatih. Um, and this is from uh, one of our graduates from your region. I think she's from Nigeria. She's asking, um, you, you work with, uh, 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 with, with widows, which is a very marginalized group. And, and the way you, you described it, uh, they're, they're situ they are really, really vulnerable. And the kind of work you do, uh, and I have seen with my own eyes, the kind of changes you see in, in, in those uh, women and the, confident, and the confidence that they have now. She's asking, do you only focus on that for running an enterprise? Do you only buy from widows or there are other women that, that you reach out to or, or you are open to working with? Because there are other mar marginalized uh, groups uh, uh, also exist. So how do you look? at that how do you actually prioritize working with with widows and then how, how do you integrate how how you remain more inclusive of other, others as well yeah okay so so um yeah thank you um so we we do recognize that there are other marginalized groups um and and also um we need to reach them but for now we we also believe that it is better to focus on a few and then really get the impact that is required before we expand. And so currently we are concentrating more on only widows. And this is because of our peculiar circumstances. Because for me, if a, if a widow tells me that, oh, now in my community, they actually call me when they are having community meetings to ask of my opinion because I am a key stakeholder in providing um, income to others, then it means that our work is done. That is what we actually, we want, we want the widow's voices to be heard at the community levels. And for now, we do not wish to dilute what we are looking for. And so we believe that there are widows that are equally having disabilities and we equally work with such women. So for now, we focus on just widows in terms of who we source our material for. If any other person wants to sell to us, we ask them to go sell it to the widows groups we are working with. Because by so doing, we are forcing an interaction with those women groups. We are giving them some power at the community level where I think we lost her again. Pati, your connection is uh, is weak again. They are recognized as to the um, the communities. Okay, okay, yeah, I I actually uh, uh, remember. I I I didn't off my. Yeah, you're breaking up, Fati. Uh, I remember visiting those uh, those widows group uh, uh, three 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 four three or four years back, and what Fati described that. Uh, if others uh, want to sell uh, that raw material to Fatih's enterprise, they make them go through the widow's group. 
and and when i ask them this this question of like how does how do they feel about it and these uh, the, 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 these uh, they told me that you know we from a situation where everybody used to hate us uh, didn't didn't talk to us didn't want to deal with us now we give them the money for their product that's a huge change in 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 the in the power in their empowerment so that was a huge, and and for them that was the most significant change that we somebody we can actually give money to to others who never even talked to us so that was the kind of change that they wanted to see and and i think those are very practical ways of ensuring that kind of empowerment for people okay one more i think we are running uh, almost out of time so i have i have one more question to all all three of you and then maybe we will uh, we will wrap it up so magali uh, you 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 run a very very successful uh, enterprise uh, that has a national impact both at, at the enterprise level but at the sector level now uh, when you think you when you talk about creating social value and 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 creating a a, a, a non profit working with that there's a change in culture as well right for running a successful for profit you have to have have that business culture so how do you navigate that like do you recruit new team or or you 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 work with your existing team how do you look at that that cultural uh, shift well thank you so much for this question because uh, this is something that is uh, people are going to be surprised by my answer there were no cultural shift because within my business we always had as a at, at heart what it was a key value to the company itself and that's why i was i was saying at the beginning we started that social enterprise without knowing that we were into that social enterprise and the struggles that we were doing we were going through is because we were missing that nonprofit part the so, the business side could not carry on with all of the agenda that we had built in uh, for us as a success to describe success so even uh, everybody who would walk into our company, into our groups would say, how come you keep that spirit alive? It, it is alive because this is what we have um, shown from day one. The, 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 the communication channel between the, the head of groups and, the, and, the, and the, the artisans has always been for me to have your back. It was never built on a business model where you are here to make me profitable. It, it has been built in day one. We are going forward together. And this is the, the model that I'm hoping that could be replicated across Haiti, because this is the only way we're gonna put down these barriers that are already programmed in everybody's head. Knowing that you're because you're born in Haiti, you have zero opportunity and, and people are there only to take advantage of you and make you work for profit is something that we need to shift. So we, this is, um, we didn't have to go through that uh, change of culture because it was built in um, the first day of the company. Mm -hmm. And and Pauline, the same question to you. I know that the team at uh, Antigonish Affordable Housing, uh, you try to make sure that there's uh, there's there's a financial uh, expert who looks after that, the the financial sustainability of the organization. There is social side. So how do you actually uh, ensure that 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 culture of 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 creating that that social value always remains? It's not always an easy thing, I guess, but part of it is um, ensuring that, that the, all members of the board, that we have an opportunity to really think about the why. Why are we doing this work? And when you think about inclusion, um, uh, one of our board members, Sister, Sister Marion Sheridan, says that inclusion is really about welcoming the no one, whoever that may be. So when you think about the agenda 2030, leave no one behind. So it's about welcoming the no one, whoever that might be, welcoming strangers, um, making sure that that is the why of what it is we're doing. So it, it's really about using your vision and your values as the touchstone for the organization and when we talk about financial, social, and environmental sustainability, in, that supports our whole agenda of inclusion as well. And if I could give you one example and how all of these things are interconnected, um, we made a decision as a board to invest in solar panels. Now that was with the help of a local organization as well. So that's not something we had to do. Uh, but it's something we chose to do because of our commitment to environmental sustainability. It also has financial implications 
because it saves energy costs for the organization, we can put some of those energy costs as direct savings to our tenants. Tenants, it decreases their energy costs. And with those savings, we can also support a position of a community navigator. And the community navigator is someone who works with our tenants to, to try to facilitate ways in which they can live well as part of our, as part of our homes. So all of these things for us, the sustainability and the inclusion are all interconnected. And, um, and we see, and it's really about keeping in touch with the why and being tenacious about our vision and our values and ensuring that everyone on the board has an opportunity uh, to, to bring diverse views to the table, but to ensure that we're all on the same page in terms of why it is we're doing the work. Okay. Now one, uh, we're almost uh, at time. Uh, so uh, two questions, very short questions to, to all three of you. We are starting the, the course that you took. Uh, we, we can't have it uh, in person now. So we are taking that course online. That course is starting on 1st of March. Uh, the applications are still open. If you can just tell me um, as, as, as someone who, who took the course, uh, would you recommend it to others? Because there, there are still uh, 70, 75 people uh, on this, in this call, why they should take it. <laughs> and the second, any advice that you may have uh, for the social entrepreneurs who are listening to you right now, for all three of you. Let's begin with you, Pauline, you're on the screen. Okay. Um, the, course, the course enabled me, as I, as I mentioned earlier, taking the course enabled me to think differently about the work that we were doing on the ground. It gave me a new framework and the, the new framework, uh, social, social enterprise, um, enabled me to think about ways in which we could strengthen the work we were doing, ways in which we could approach it differently to have a uh, greater impact, whether that's how we talk about the work in, um, in approaching uh, funders or even in, in approaching new people to sit on the board in any number of ways. So it gave me a different framework upon which I could attach what I knew was happening on the ground through my experience. So that was helpful. It also gave me a much better sense of connection with many other people around the globe who are working similarly, similarly uh, to support similar visions and, and missions, whether it's in social enterprise for women's economic empowerment or supporting housing developments um, anywhere in the world. It, it's a, a greater sense of solidarity and, and just simply being able to benefit from the incredible knowledge and experience that you and Farouk bring to the table uh, also added incredible value. So again, thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, Magali, any um, thank you. social entrepreneurs and, and would you recommend the course? I would definitely recommend the course because he changed my, my company and I changed the way I, I saw myself doing business going forward. And uh, most of all, I think that it's really important that we understand this, this class gives you a clear understanding of how powerful the social enterprises um, are going to be uh, as they can play, key, play a key role into changing the future of the world. Uh, when we're talking about reducing gaps, we're talking about inclusion, we're talking about zero poverty, these are worldwide issues that only can be addressed by social enterprises. So I think that this course gives you the right tools and uh, the right mindset, which is the most important, for you to, to understand how, uh, as a social entrepreneur, you could contribute to that world change. Thank you, Magali. Thank you. Uh, Fatih, are you still there? I'm here. I'm here. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, most definitely, I would recommend the course to everybody. Um, for me, Usually when I go for a course, I'm looking at how practical it is. How easy is it for me to be able to apply it? And for me, being part of that course actually made it very easy to understand how to practicalize it going forward. And so if even you have started a social enterprise and you are struggling with how to conceptualize the structure and everything, being part of this course will actually let you clarify those misconceptions and make and have a clear focus how to, uh, about going forward. So definitely everybody should um, be part of this course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fatih. Thank you, Magali. Thank you, Pauline. 
those who are interested, uh, as I said, the course is still open um, uh, and it will start uh, March 1st, uh, online seven weeks. Thank you very much, all three of you. Uh, it's so nice to have you back. Uh, thanks to the technology, we can have you back uh, in the in the uh, in, uh, through Zoom back to Cody again. Uh, all the best with your with your work, uh, Magali, uh, Fati, and, uh, and and Pauline. And and we all we only want you to succeed, succeed, and and, and further succeed, and and carry forward that social mission. Thank you very much.